Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. Howdy do, buckaroos. <laughs> oh, my Lanta. Okay. Welcome back, you guys. It's uh, Cammie and Elizabeth, you know, your favorite podcasters. This is the Biz Birthday Bash podcast. Welcome, welcome. Um, today, we are talking about printing things in-house. Should you do it? Should you not do it? Is it the worst? Is it the best? We don't know. Actually, we do know, but we're going to tell you all about it. <laughs> talk about the pros and cons of printing in-house versus outsourcing. And explain like why we made the choices we did when it came to those types of things. Because there's definitely pros and cons, pluses and minuses to either one. But you guys ask this question all the time. We see it in our Facebook group. We see people talking about it. And yeah, we're just going to have a nice little combo about printing in-house today. Yes. I'm excited to talk about this because we've never super formally addressed it because There's a wide array of things. And to be honest, like I think Cammie and I needed a couple years under our belt to like really understand what do people mean when they ask this question? (laughs) Like, What are people trying to get at? And what are the reasons that people want to print in house in the first place? Or the reasons that they are considering that option? So we have kind of over the years, realized that there's kind of three reasons why people are asking this question. The first reason is they want to save money. The second reason is, well, they think that it's going to save them money, I guess I should say. (laughs) The second reason (laughs) is that they maybe want more control over the final product because they have a very specific vision. And the third one is that the quote unquote quicker turnaround option of having things done in house for you. So I feel like those are the three things, but we have to address kind of each of those separately. (laughs) So let's start out with like the saving money aspect, Cami. Like before we dive into actually printing in house and types of printers, et cetera, et cetera. Do we feel like it really saves you money to print in house, depending on what you're doing? <sighs> you know, you know, when you first start out and you think you're, sa- yeah, you definitely think you're saving so much money. You'd be like, I'll just print these at home. It's going to be so much quicker. But after all the troubleshooting and the ink and the cost of the printer itself and everything like that, it truly doesn't save you money in the long run, or at least in my experience. I mean, it might be, and sometimes you can probably get it comparable to like how many down to like a little bit of cents, like a couple of pennies of difference. But the time it takes too, because time is money in your business, um, that is where the biggest cost truly lies. And I mean, obviously, we'll talk about like troubleshooting and all that good stuff too. But I don't feel like it saved me a ton of money (laughs) ever, uh, which is why I've always outsourced things like my greeting cards and prints and invitations. I mean, doing those in-house would cost so much more than just getting them done. I mean, the wholesale printers now, you can get such a great, great deal. Like they're they're not that expensive at all, really. And because they understand what they're doing, they do it every single day. They have the machinery in place to do it, the employees in place and everything on the back end. And also too, just to clarify, a lot of times when people ask us this question, they are asking about what Cami kind of already mentioned, greeting cards, prints, flat printing, and digital printing for the most part. That's when people are trying to figure out like what printer is the best to buy. They're like literally looking on Amazon for something that is like a plug and play situation, yeah. <laughs> not like a letterpress printer or foil printer. Yeah. And we will talk about those later, but like w- the saving money aspect, that mindset tends to circle around the flat printing specifically. Yeah. And you got to think too, these print shops where you're ordering from are buying the paper by like, you know, they're just buying huge amounts of paper. Like, so they're getting a great price on it. So you might buy a ream of paper where you get 250 sheets. So you're not getting as great of a price anyway, um, as they would. Um, So that adds up to just thinking like the wholesale cost difference on that. And then we all know ink is very expensive. And if you've ever printed anything with an inkjet printer, you know, it takes up gobs of ink. (laughs) Yep. So 
there's that whole thing. And when it's all said and done, by the time you do that, have a paper trimmer to trim it the right size, score it if you need to for greeting cards. You were losing money by losing time. (laughs) Yes. And so what really can help is to have something printed, like outsource the printing. Maybe you're trying to make a booklet for wedding things and then maybe do some of the assembly in house. You know, if you're trying to get like very creative with a specific thing that you're making, it's not just a flat card. There's like multiple pieces still. It's probably still best in your interest to outsource each individual piece and then bring them all together in house. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I just think it's, it's just like, so much extra stress. Like, why would you want to do that? You guys, it's already a stressful thing too. Um, and I, you know, that I don't know where we're going to like talk about this, but I, I know one of the things, if you're only selling like five greeting cards a week or whatever, maybe it does make sense for you to do the printing in house because you're not ready to invest fully yet, but it's better to just start off with that really great quality from the get go and understand how the ordering process works because it's going to be so much easier to scale than kind of getting stuck with something that's going to be harder to scale if you got an order of like 5,000. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first started out and I was in my first apartment and I wanted to print foil cards. <laughs> so I got a laser jet printer because you have to have the laser ink to work with the mink foiling um, machine. I had one of those too. I had one Do of those Do you too. guys remember those? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was like the thing like five years ago, six years ago, you know, like to make a couple things on your own in-house. And oh my gosh, the amount of money that I spent to get all that stuff set up and buy it and put it all in place. I didn't like, I barely like sold anything. It's also that I didn't have like a long-term strategy with it. But from a scaling standpoint, like you said, Cami, like let's say that that had picked up a lot and I was selling hundreds of those cards a week, I would have had to outsource anyway. <laughs> like <laughs> that's where yeah. it would have gone eventually. So sometimes it makes sense maybe for like prototyping purposes. Like I know Cami with your party pennants for a long time, you were able to print those in-house before exploring a long-term option when you scaled. Yes. I I mean, I I start off a lot of things in-house. As you guys know, like I do a ton of stuff in-house and I'm like, well, let's just list it and sell it and see what happens. And I get myself in trouble with this a lot. (laughs) Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I I love this. I love getting myself in trouble and then figuring it out. But I am of the mindset that I like to test before I invest, um, especially things that are going to require a lot of upfront costs, like getting a die made or whatever, which isn't even that expensive. But I mean, it is kind of pricey, I guess. I don't know. But (laughs) yeah, okay. Let's put it in context. When you paid for the die for your penance, eventually, are you willing to share how much you paid for a die? I'm not even sure how much the die costs because everything was all wrapped up together. Okay. (laughs) So I don't know. Usually dies are like, $200 to $300-ish. Okay. Um, So it could have been anywhere along that, along those lines. Uh, But I didn't have a line item of the die. It was just like, oh, the die is included in this first thing. And I don't know. Okay. Sorry, guys. I don't have an exact number. But yeah, I wasn't like ready to do that, I guess. (laughs) Although now I'm like, that was idiotic. But yeah, (laughs) um, I also was worried too about, you know, when I'm ordering the party pennants and outsourcing them, the higher quantity I get, the way better price I get. So I kept my margins super, super low on those to even make sure they would work before I invested in buying like 500, 1,000 of each party pennant design. Um, So I waited a little too long, I think, to go ahead and outsource those. But yeah, it's fine. (laughs) So don't make that mistake that I do. I do this all the time to myself. But but yeah, I I definitely love to, to test things and make things myself. Um, Also, the quality when you outsource, you're just like, oh, this is so much better, so much better than what I was printing because I know I've wasted a ton of time trying to color match what I wanted it to look like versus the file on screen. And then I had to basically work backwards when I did want to outsource because I the files looked neon and I'm like, well, I don't want it to be neon. I want it to be red or whatever. So I had to kind of take steps backwards to redesign those files to get them reprint to print them outsource and that was the whole thing so don't do that (laughs) yeah still working on that I was asking you I just have to say I was asking you pretty early on like so what's the like long-term plan here but that's part of the cami magic though is that you do bring so many fun things to life really really quickly 
And then you'd figure it out later. And that's just like your energy and your that's strategy. It works that's, super well for you. So, you uh, know. My strategy is probably not the smartest strategy, but it has worked very well for me. It's called <laughs> Cammy's Magical Chaos Strategy. It's the chaos <laughs> strategy. It's, it's the chaotic strategy. If you get stressed out really easily, this is not the strategy for you. Okay? <laughs> no. We don't recommend this actually as like a normal business strategy. But like – Cammy is Cammy, you know, we're all our own person and you have to find what works for you. But like, <laughs> oh, I'm just like, but you guys no. aren't Cammy. That's the thing is like no one else listening is like, is you. So, you know. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, there's still, I mean, there's still stuff that I have to print health because I haven't figured it out. I mean, I just need to sit down and take the time to do all my, set up all my files, which I'm like, I finally feel like I have some time to do all that <laughs> to get the dyes right. made. Honestly, you know, I know it took me so long to do that, get the dyes made is because I didn't know how to do it in Illustrator. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, it's not even that hard. <laughs> oh, when you hear the way that I end up doing it, it is like the most, it's just so backwards. <laughs> I don't even know what I did. I'm like, oh, okay. I think, oh gosh. But yeah, so <laughs> the files aren't straight lines because they're watercolor. There's a lot of edges. I got really confused, but I fixed it. I, I came up with my own cami method. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now doing it for the party punches, I'm like, oh Lord, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be a doozy. Cause I kind of figured out how to do like the cutout lines that I wanted on the Silhouette Cameo software, which doesn't translate over to Illustrator. Illustrator will translate to Cameo, but not vice versa. Uh Uh, Created a whole shenanigans. So anyway, don't do what I do, you guys. Just listen to what I say. (laughs) Speak from (laughs) experience. Well, I am glad to hear that you're trying to get the dyes for the party punchies too. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah, for sure. Um, simplifying those a little bit. But again, I sometimes I'm like, I don't know if this one's going to sell. So I'm going to do these myself for a little bit. And now that I have a grip on which ones sell, um, I think I will always do that when I introduce a new one, though. Because yeah, I just don't want to invest in something. Like there's some that I thought would be really, really take off and they didn't. And I was like, hmm, okay, I'm glad I'm not buying a die for those. Like I can cut out those really quickly for the handful of orders we get for those um that oh i'm design. curious like i'm always curious oh, the to one know. that i always thought would do so well is like the little miniature pink pennant party punchies because i just think those are oh. so cute and they just like eh, every once in a while so <laughs> and i'm like these seem like the best but also with the this is now this is just me complaining about my all, all my stuff but also okay. with the party punchies like think about the butterflies that's 12 different dyes basically unless i could get a die where that does all of them at once Right. You know, mm. that's a, that's a big investment. The party punchies get a little, get a little. Yeah. Funky. Right. Yeah. 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 They yeah. get. Yeah. Hmm. So things like that. I'm like, Oh, it cost me this. I know how much it costs me to print and cut it in house. And it's mostly just time. So on those, so things like the football or the tree where it's one single design, that's a lot easier to scale than something like the butterflies. Anyway, right. moving so on maybe, from my life. <laughs> yeah, I know, but maybe your pack has to be like one type of butterfly. I know yeah. that's not as fun. But I know. See, that's just not as fun. So yeah, all those little things, but that's that's not a problem right now. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that was kind of all under the like, do we really save money category? <laughs> yeah. Um, and Cammy already kind of touched over like control over the final product where she admitted that the quality of some of the stuff she's outsourced now is way better <laughs> than what Definitely. she was doing in house. Yeah. So- I mean, when you outsource, their inks are so much more robust and so much more colorful. You can get, it's so much easier to get those bright colors you want than trying to do it with an inkjet printer yourself. So yeah, having that to get it perfect, but also at the same time, you do get control on, you are the one setting up that file and, and cutting it or, or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? You are watching it come out and playing with it and you can adjust those things and, and get it. I don't, I don't know. There's just a few things. Like I'm trying to think of a specific product. Like for me, the party punchies, for example, like those I'm like, okay, I have so much control. I can adjust the cut lines, smaller or bigger. If I want them to be a little tighter, like and I can play with that as I'm printing them. But when I send off that final file, I'm just like, well, I hope I get it back. And it's what I wanted <laughs> sometimes. Right. So you do have that like experimental time, which I think is a really fun part of the creative process because you get to be very hands on in terms of scaling. Not so great in terms of creative process and enjoying it. Great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
For the quicker turnaround element of things, it can seem like sometimes it would be to your advantage to just like have it in house to go next door to do something really quick. Cammy says this has worked if she's run out of a greeting card to sign before and she needs a couple extra on hand. <laughs> um, yeah. Like that's nice <laughs> to be able to be like, oh, I can go print a few more because we're still waiting for the next round of orders to come in. But you know, they got their inventory sorted out now. So it's not as much of an issue. You should be okay this year. <laughs> you guys should be okay this year. But um, sometimes it's worth it to wait that extra time to have it done professionally by the pros rather than trying to bring that all in house to do it yourself. It it, it can be so situational, which is really hard, but we are going to talk about the types of printers too and situations in general that do work for printing in house. So that is coming up. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Because I will say too, like I love having the ability to, if I need to print something, I can, and I can, I have the paper stock that I use all the time. And that has been a huge lifesaver for me. It's more just like an emergency print if I need it versus like, I'm going to, you know, print my entire inventory line <laughs> kind of thing, which would just, it would just never work. And every time I've like outsourced anything, like a lot of times I print envelopes in house. Um, and my recently my white ink printer was just like losing its absolute mind. And I was like, okay, I got to get these out today. And there's a print shop literally across the street. And so I went over there and they did them and they had them done in like an hour. And I was like doing stuff and I just went and picked them up and it was like 50 bucks. So I was like, wow, that was way easier than me sitting here feeding envelopes. Of course, if I needed one more, I could do it. My white ink printer, which I got to fix, by the way, it was just some stupid faulty toner issue. It wasn't even a big deal. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's great to have on hand for those, for having your, you know, print those prototypes, print that last minute, one greeting card you need, one envelope you need, like that kind of thing. When it comes to major, major volume, it's just not good. <laughs> yes. And, and especially in, like we said, kind of like the flat print, digital print world, it's very print, different print, yeah. when you are a specialized printer, like you have your own letterpress shop and you're doing production in house and all sorts of things. Like it's an, it's an entirely different business model, actually. Yeah, that is, that is totally, totally different. Yeah. Everything I'm thinking of is just flat printed basically. Yep. Okay. So Let's go ahead and actually break down the different types of printers. Let's talk first about digital printers, Cami, just so we can tell our okay. audience the difference between the two of them. Yeah. So the digital printer is like the ones that we use for any kind of flat printing or the, a laser printer or an inkjet printer. Um, let's see. How do I break down this? Break them down separately. Well, an inkjet obviously uses like liquid ink. And then the laser is shooting a toner, which is kind of like this powdery stuff um, with like heat. And laser printers can't handle very thick paper because the paper is going through rollers. So pretty much an envelope is about as thick as you can get when it comes to those. They're more, they're very quick. They're very fast. The toner is very expensive. Um, So, but they last for a long time. Um, The ink jets are slow, but they can handle thicker paper. Like if you were trying to print on handmade paper, which is something we can talk about too, is like its own little category versus in-house versus outhouse. Yep. (laughs) Outhouse. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. Um, (laughs) Anyway, the ink jets are slow, but a lot of them are like back fed. So you can put thicker paper through and kind of manipulate those a little bit. So I have one of each of those. And I think Elizabeth does too. Yep, I have my laser printer is a brother printer, which I just do a lot of. um, It's actually just a black and white grayscale printer. So I do a lot of sometimes like order forms off of there. I used to do labels before I got my Dymo printer, which by the way, the Dymo printer is thermal inking printing, excuse me. So that's like it never runs out of ink. It just uses heat. It's so cool. Magic. I don't (laughs) get it. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so my brother printer is a little handy-dandy hardcore guy, and then the Canon IP820, is that what we both have? Uh, 8720. 8720, thank you. So we both have that inkjet printer, which now that I like think about it, I would occasionally use for things kind of more of like a prototyping thing when designing backers for like my butterfly garden stakes and stuff like that. But a lot of people want that printer because 
I don't know. Why do they want that printer, Cami? Because, because like everyone was using that printer all the time. <laughs> Don't know. What did oh. oh envelopes envelopes there? I was like, I know that there's a reason <laughs> that I have this printer. It's just been a second since I've used it for that purpose. Yes, envelope printing on that printer because I can like open the flap and backfeed it, kind of what Cami was saying. But then Cami also has you have an HP right, which is that uh, also an inkjet? I actually have two HP. No, those are the two laser jet ones. Um, I took okay. them. One of the newer. Because when I thought mine was broken, I panicked and ordered another one. So that was stupid. Um, and then I missed the return window. So. <laughs> so oh, okay. We- oh, no, it's okay, though, because I needed one um, out there for the girls to print stuff. So it's fine. Anyway, um, so I have two of those. And I actually use those for envelopes a lot as well. They do pretty well with it. And I have my the ghost toner that I can stick the white ink in there, and which is great for doing white ink envelope printing. Um, I would never use it for like, white ink invitations or anything because the paper would be like very thin and the outsourcing obviously looks so much better, but for addresses, it's been fantastic. So yes. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. But they don't make that model anymore. The one you have. Uh, yeah. They don't make the one I have that works with the ghost toner. And then I have one of the newer models, the DW. I don't, I don't remember the name of my printer. I'm like looking at it from right here, but I can't read it. <laughs> so okay. I know I have it listed on, uh, my Amazon page, the camerone.com slash supplies. And then it's just the newer model of whatever I have listed there. It's like the NW versus the DW. <laughs> and that does or does not work with the ghost toner. The now. newer one does not work with the ghost toner. But if you just go to the ghost toner site, they have all the ones that are compatible. So, oh. but you could have to buy, you could buy the old one that still works with it. I think it's like $800 now though. Oh, geez. I wish I got mine for 80. Remember that? That was crazy. (laughs) Yeah, you got yours for so cheap. And then I got one of those at 1.2 and bought a thing of ghost toner, which I never actually put in it because the printer was like giving me fits when I was just trying to do test like normal test print stuff and i was like i don't think this thing is working how it should be and then i got even more suspicious that it might have been like returned originally to me anyways like i can't remember how i had gone about buying it because maybe it's i did buy- i had that it was amazon prime day and it was warehouse and like a warehouse deal and i was like guys everyone and you bought one too because i was like elizabeth this is a great deal <laughs> Yes, and <laughs> yeah. I think it was a warehouse deal because it had been returned by somebody. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, there was some stuff that was just kind of like messed up with it. So I returned it and got rid of it. Then I like never reordered a new one. And it's okay because I didn't need it because I do all my white ink printing for envelopes through a vendor that I outsource to that I love anyways. And also I'm like not printing envelopes that much anymore because like both Cami and I just don't do as many wedding invitations. Yeah, taking some time off from wedding invitations over here because baby's coming. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, yep, I know. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah, so those have been great. And then um, other printers. Let's see, letterpress printer. I wish I had one of those, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that's like a whole other conversation about printing in house as a letterpress printer. Yep, yep. Letterpress printing, old world, beautiful style of printing. Highly recommend checking out Learn Letterpress by Britt Rohr. She is the owner of Swell Press. I helped her make the course and it was super fun and amazing. And if you guys want to know all the things about what it means to letterpress print and starting your own letterpress shop or just learning in general, that would be a great place to start when she opens that up. Um, And I think she's opening it up like the very end of like November, right after the Black Friday weekend. So keep that in mind. (laughs) (laughs) I have so much respect for letterpress printers. I mean, doing all that work in house and mixing these things, I'm just like, oh, my Lanta. Like, I get annoyed if my inkjet like runs out. I'm like, oh my gosh, all I got to do is like open a little thing and put it in there. (laughs) Like, I can't imagine doing all the work of a letterpress printer. It just like blows my ever love in mind so yeah that's why they're like almost <laughs> they're both in the printing world but they're in their own universe yeah like, it's it's a it's a whole nother a whole other thing so yeah <laughs> completely different then i also wanted to touch really quick on okay well like foil printing as well that also depending on if you're doing pressed foil or digital foil those both you would normally outsource them unless you're like really passionate about doing it in-house. Yeah. (laughs) And the last two that I wrote down 
just because people might be curious, are UV printers and the Glowforge because it's kind of a printer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a 3D printer. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a 3D printer. It's completely Yeah, it's different. not. It's not. That's not what I mean. But, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it can help you not create literally. things that would be like, yeah, like, multi, you know, three-dimensional whatever because you can engrave <laughs> on something. You can – um, it's a tool. A design, like, I don't know. I don't like, know. Like, it is more. Yeah, yeah it like is more of a tool. tool. It's a laser. And so, like, I did all of my brother's place cards for his wedding. These little foxes with everyone's names on them. Um, and I used the Glowforge to do that. And so, that was great because that was a very specific, like, finessed project. I had something in mind that I wanted to do, and rather than having to find a vendor to do that, I was able to do it on my own. Pretty easily because the Glowforge does not have like that crazy of a learning curve. I just think that they have such good resources. Um, but like if you're going to any like UV printer or like laser printer, like the Glowforge, you're starting to talk like $4,000, $5,000 and up. Um, <laughs> so that has to be like a really conscious decision if you want to bring one of those in house. But we have an interview coming up with Samantha Besley, Hopefully I said her last name right. And she, like her whole business has taken off because of the Glowforge. So people literally build their businesses around that the same way they build their business around like letterpress printing. UV printing is also like the machines are a lot more expensive, but you can print like white ink onto acrylics. You can print imagery onto acrylics. Like those machines are really, really robust too. And also really expensive. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Those are definitely expensive. Oh, I would love to have something I could print on acrylic. <laughs> yes, right. And, it, yes. you know, there's like – there's different ones in terms of like their bed size. Like I know someone who owns one that has like a huge bed size. Oh, my gosh. I can't remember. It's probably like – 10 feet long and like six feet wide. Yeah. Like it's a really big machine. Guys, those machines are like in the six figures. That is like how much a machine <laughs> like that costs. You like <laughs> lease it. You like lease the printer. It's like so insane. But they have a full-fledged business that's like built around that specifically. Um, yeah, I did like some research on not a printer, but a cutter thing. And they're like as big as a car. <laughs> And yeah, so I was like, this is so cool. And it's kind of like how like an air hockey table like sucks it down and does like printing with that. And I was like, trying, I don't know, I was like looking at stuff. And I was like, well, the good news is I have Alex to figure out any technical sides of things. And I was like, should I get one? They had like some smaller versions. Because I was like trying to think for like party punches and stuff. I was like, I could do these and have like a much quicker, you know, like it was a better thing versus like having to buy those dies. I'm like, if I'm going to invest into these dies, I might as well invest into this machine. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, oh, and I went down this whole rabbit hole, but then, and then I got a shop and I haven't had the time to think about that for a long time. <laughs> that was like in June or July. I remember thinking about that and definitely going down some rabbit holes with that and watching YouTube videos. And I was like, this is so cool, but there's so many things you can, you can get in trouble with. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, like Cami said, like the biggest thing is like research, research, research. Whenever you are trying to produce any certain type of thing, whether that is something as simple as a greeting card all the way to like an extensive laser cut or like crazy printed acrylic sign, whatever it may be, like you have to understand what that entails and what goes into that and the process behind everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we've kind of come full circle, right? Because we've talked about like all the types of printers. We've talked about the printers that we have on hand. Cami has mentioned her supplies list where she kind of has some of those listed. Let's talk about some situations that can work for printing in house. Like what we used it for. We've already touched on this a little bit, but like, let's make this its official like little section. Okay. Official little section. Um, Envelope addressing. We both have used it for that. And it's been fantastic to be able to do that because I swear there's always like a handful that you still need left over or whatever. And it's, and for me, that's been easier than having to coordinate with the printer and send the envelopes and all that jazz. So I have loved it for that. Um, also, because I do kind of funky envelope designs and that's allowed me to, you know, have that control over the final product <laughs> and, and play with that. So I've loved it for that. 
for me too, as well, the prototypes and tests for bigger print runs. Elizabeth talked about like printing off backers to see if stuff would work. And let me just tell you, having a printer on hand, doesn't even matter what kind you have, even I print stuff on my laser jet all the time, just to print off something that I'm thinking for like a sticker or packaging so I can print it the actual size and just cut it out and see what it would look like is invaluable. Like if you do nothing, just get a printer just for that. So you can print something at the same size your sticker would be. And then you can say, oh, that's too big for the greeting card or whatever, (laughs) you know, like that is where honestly some of the magic of just having a printer at all is helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like being able to like generally prototype like, and you should be doing that (laughs) as a rule of thumb. (laughs) Like you should be prototyping things because just asking someone else a question of like, what's the appropriate size for a details card or an RSVP card? Well, cut stuff to the size and move it around and decide like which one you like best or print off a couple options and cut them out and move them around. So yeah, printer on hand, always, always a good idea. Yeah, exactly. If you can't print something, then I just cut little pieces of paper in the right size and do stuff too. And yes. you have to have anything on it. Um, There's so many good ways to prototype. Yeah, you yes. can be cutting out and like then- cardboard for all we care. Like... <laughs> I do that sometimes too. Um, And then handmade paper, handmade paper. Elizabeth, you talk about handmade paper. I hate handmade paper. We both do. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We both hate handmade paper. Here's how I honestly feel, okay? I'm probably going to like tick off a lot of people by saying this. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I feel like you are sinning against handmade paper when you try to digital print on it, okay? I'm just going to put (laughs) it out there. This is how I personally feel. Do not cancel me for this, okay? All you stationers listening. I know that it can be done to digitally print or flat print on handmade paper. But in my mind, if you're going to use handmade paper, it deserves the beauty of letterpress or foil pressed printing. That is like my personal opinion. So the one time that I did do handmade paper for a client, I still didn't like it, but we did letterpress it and that made things like a little bit better. People have like all sorts of crazy methods for digital printing on handmade paper. Sometimes this entails taping each individual piece to like a letter size sheet (laughs) so that the edges aren't like all ruffled up and like caught and messed up and then putting it through that way. Sometimes it involves just like putting it through as is and then like raise taking a razor to the edges to like do any cleanup. People have found all sorts of crazy ways to do this. You got to set your mind to it if you're going to do that because that is like quite the project. So I, I will always say, foil or letterpress for handmade paper but people like people do it so i have done a full suite digitally printed on handmade paper and i hated my life (laughs) (laughs) and i never did it again (laughs) yeah and i just remember like trying to get it to print and having like the hardest hardest time we were about to like leave on vacation i like had to mail it before we left and it was like so chaotic and you know you need so much extra um, handmade paper and I had like two pieces left and I was like I have to get these right this is like- <laughs> yes, and yes. I, I managed to get it but oh my goodness I think I like that that's when I started getting gray hair I'm not even kidding that is like what <laughs> happened so it all makes sense now okay all right then moving on <laughs> mm-hmm. yep agree with you I feel like you always reach a point like in business <laughs> where like you're doing something crazy like that and you're like, never again. Never this again. And I never did will again. never happen ever again. And I reached that point with watercolor this past year um, <laughs> when I did that save the date. And then I was fired before we did the invitations. <laughs> so never again. <laughs> and I knew, I knew in my heart of hearts, like while I was doing that, I was like, this isn't like, this isn't the right fit. Like this isn't what I want to be doing anymore. I wasn't serving that client well. And parting ways, like, what's the best for everybody? So, yeah, I'm humbling myself today, guys. I might have talked about that a little bit before, but if I hadn't, it happens. It does happen. So, last final question, does printing at home work for everyone? And I've kind of divided this into two, like, closing points. And the first one is, 
that the longer people are in business and the more their business grows, the more they often realize that printing in-house isn't as much of an option for them, depending on what they want their focus to be. So like Cami is a good example of this. (laughs) I'm a great example. (laughs) Yeah, you're the perfect example of like, you'll prototype occasional things, but you've reached the point in your business that for the most part, you're like, I'm going to go ahead and just outsource this. This isn't where my time lies. This isn't how I want to be using my time. I have other things to focus on. And then the second kind of category is that some people build their businesses around like their stationary businesses this way by doing specifically printing things in house, whether it's white ink printing, digital printing on handmade paper, laser cutting, letterpress, and that is like the foundation of their business. They set out to be a printer to then sell invitations or sell a product or sell something like that. They didn't set out to make invitations, right? And then decide like, I'm going to become a printer and get all this machinery. <laughs> like Normally yeah. that doesn't happen that way. Sometimes it happens that way, but that's kind of like the way that I see things playing out. Yeah. It's kind of like part of their business model. I mean, obviously Britt from Swell Press is a great example of this because she has like her own unique way of printing letterpress. And that's like the crux of her business, you know, is that signature method that she has. And so things like that, I, you're absolutely right. There's like two different kind of avenues you can go down the hole. with. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think that kind of wraps up our episode on do we print things in house? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah I feel like to. it's like the biggest, like most ominous question whenever people ask that question. And I'm like, I you know. know what? We just like need now we have an episode, right? So now when it comes up again, now we can tell people like, here's our episode, here's all our thoughts, take them or leave them, whatever you want to do. Hopefully this doesn't divide the stationary community. No, I'm just kidding. Like I don't think anyone's <laughs> gonna be that mad about anything I said. I think people know that I'm being for realsies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think keeping it hundred. <laughs> oh, yeah, so pretty much the short answer to that is no, except maybe a little bit every once in a while. <laughs> yep, exactly. Like it is mostly a no for sure. Yeah, yeah. ninety five percent no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, lovelies. I think that wraps things up for today. Uh, you know the drill if you've been around here for a while, but if you haven't, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We would love to hear from you. Um, Those really do make our day when we can go back and read them from you. And it helps other creatives find us too, because we're more likely to pop up in that feed on iTunes or wherever people listen to podcasts. So I think it's like annoying. I wish Spotify let people write reviews too. I don't know why they don't. So Spotify, if you're listening, let people write reviews. It's really annoying that you don't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and then last but not least, if you do have any additional questions for us, you can go to bizbirthdaybash.com and go to our podcast page where you'll see a little button for the Q and cake episodes. You can leave us a question there. If there's anything else that you're curious about, we're still combing through a lot of old questions that we have. We've done a couple episodes from 2019, which has actually been really funny, Cammie, because one of the girls came back and she was like, I was listening to this episode. (laughs) She was like, I was listening to this and I heard my question and she was like, that question was from like two years ago and I don't even like remotely do like any of that stuff anymore. Like her (laughs) business has changed so much. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I hope we didn't like (laughs) embarrass you. Like, by, like reading just working through some old ones that we never did so. yeah yeah and so anyways good times guys um that wraps us up for today though and we will see you next time bye hey there fellow stationers are you creating custom invitations and still sending a lackluster contract that's hacked together with google searches and generic templates we've got you We've created a custom stationary contract written for stationers by stationers, and it is lawyer reviewed and approved. Hashtag legal rockstar. The custom stationary contract template covers every stationary snafu, protects you and your client's interests, and sets up an expectation of professionalism. We've combined our previous contracts as well as years of experience to bring you a contract that covers your booty and your biz. Become a put-together pro and breathe a sigh of relief knowing that you have a contract that is easy to understand and avoids confusing legal jargon. 
The custom stationery contract template is only $297, which is much less than what you can expect to pay anywhere else. And it's written by two gals who have seen it all. Spoiler alert, it's us. It's time to do things right. Go to bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash contract to purchase and download your copy today. And as a special treat, use code podcast2020 to get $20 off. And that's podcast, all caps, 2020 to get $20 off. Woohoo!